Uh, and thank you all for coming. I'm, 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 I'm happy uh, and surprised to see all of you here. Um, I'll feel more comfortable, although I'll miss you all when it becomes a thinner group. Um, let me begin by talking about, for just a couple of minutes, what prompted me to um, take on this little project. In late May of 2009, in a blog that is a good uh, source for reflection on religion, secularity, and public life, a blog called The Imminent Frame, Professor Ron Thiemann of Harvard Divinity School wrote a piece on Obama as public theologian. He begins um, by comparing our very young and new president with Abraham Lincoln uh, as they both stand in a long and distinguished tradition of public theology. Seaman cites uh, President Obama's inaugural address, which he says combines cautious realism with measured hope through appeals to a God whose providence governs the course of history and who delivered and entrusted a promise that all human beings are created equal. For Thiemann, Obama uses theology to inspire citizens beyond old hatreds and towards a common humanity. And he adds that the president seems to be involved in a serious attempt to be a public theologian for the whole nation. The tradition that Thiemann cites that Obama shares, in addition to Lincoln, includes John Locke, James Madison, Martin Luther King Jr., and James Baldwin. Upon reading that list, and actually when Brett Wil Wilmot saw my description, he hesitated too. Upon reading that list, I hesitated. It struck me as, as rather broad, unclear, and surely the case that Thiemann pre presented for some members as being in that tradition, which Obama shares, struck me as, as, as not persuasive. So thinking that if just about everybody's a public theologian, then nobody is. Uh, I wanted to take a closer look at this question about traditions of public theology, what public theologians might be, and how Obama may or may not be one. So that prompts uh, the following reflections. The page I gave you, which, is, uh, which has writing on both sides, text on both sides, um, it, I'd like to spend some time going through now before I turn to the specific case of, of Barack Obama. In the first section, I provide a couple of standing definitions of a Christian public theology. The first belongs to um, Kenneth and Michael Himes. Uh, Professor Himes, of course, was here uh, for an Ethics for Lunch uh, session earlier this term, and his brother. A book called Fullness of Faith, published in 1993. In part, the Himeses identify public theology as the effort to discover and communicate the socially significant meanings of Christian symbols and traditions. Crucial to that definition, and I'm not going to read all these texts, I'm going to kind of ask you to be somewhat PowerPointish with respect to this, and I'll comment on these texts as you're reading through them. Um, part of that, that definition, as you see, though, is to talk about how public theology is not merely apologetic. It is not merely an effort to subordinate Christian witness to political relevance. No, it's an effort to take seriously the social significance of the faith of, the Christian, of a Christian community. So it is, as they put it, though not in this definition, a hermeneutic enterprise rather than an apologetic enterprise. Um, public theology wants to serve church and society, and a church that isn't aware of the broader social, public, and political impact of its faith is not having a faith that's full. It's not a community that is enjoying the fullness of faith. The second definition by Duncan Forrester in a book published in 2000 uh, sounds similar but also somewhat distinct themes. Theology is talk about God, but it's a talk about God and the Christian God for Forrester in a way that wants to point to publicly accessible truths. And in pointing to those publicly accessible truths, um, you wish to contribute to public discussion um, regarding socially significant issues and questions uh, of the day. So on the one hand, and in keeping with the Himeses, public theology is 
confessional and evangelical. That is, it is expressive of one's concrete faith. It is evangelical in that it understands uh, in its confession that the Christian faith is about good news and it wishes to communicate that. But it wishes to communicate that by reading the signs of the times, what is going on in the world, and to contribute some sort of um, interpretation of what is going on in the world for the purpose of uh, social well-being, <coughs> anticipating uh, by way of foretaste the kingdom of God, and so forth. So there are two definitions of public theology. It seeks a certain kind of relevance, but not just a relevance to the issues of the day, but also a relevance to one's own faith and understanding it most fully. Now, after setting up those two definitions, I turn uh, to um, classic public theologians in America. And um, there are three usual suspects in this account, as you would read other studies of public theology in America. The first is Abraham Lincoln, and I provide on this handout um, the final words of Lincoln's second inaugural address. Recall this is just prior to the conclusion of the Civil War, where the war is effectively won uh, by uh, Union forces. And this text, I would suggest, is, among other things, a theological exercise in expressing a certain kind of humility or caution uh, about how we read the war with a view to encouraging reconciliation between the warring parties. It begins with a suggestion of division. It begins with a suggestion that both sides in the war read the same Bible and each invoked the aid of the Bible, God's aid against the other. Lincoln immediately moves after announcing that sort of recognizable, divisive move, you know, wishing God to be on your side in war. He moves from there actually to rendering a kind of qualified moral judgment. It may seem strange that those who would um, ask a just God's assistance in wringing their bread from the sweat of others' faces would go forward, but then he immediately steps back, citing Matthew 7, 1, let us judge not. We should judge not lest we be judged. So there's a commitment to a kind of normative understanding of the wrongfulness of slavery, but then an immediate reserve. Because in fact, as the text goes on, the prayers of each side were not answered fully. Both could not be answered, but neither side's prayers were answered fully. For the Almighty in this war has his own purposes. So here's a certain kind of caution before providence the suggestion that uh, the effort to control God to serve one's purposes um, is, is, is uh, a vain effort. Um, and then Lincoln goes on after citing Matthew 18, 7, woe unto the world because of offenses, because it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Goes on to give an account of divine justice which understands that um, in God's design, American slavery may be one of those offenses that um, uh, now God wills to remove. Uh, and God gives both North and South this war. As the woe and suffering do to North and South both, insofar it is in virtue of both by whom the offense came. So providence, with its own purposes, in an act of divine justice to remove this scourge of slavery, inflicts this war and its suffering on both sides by whom the offense came. And indeed, if in fact every drop of blood spilled during this war um, uh, is necessary to match every drop of blood one are taken by the bondsman's lash, then who can deny that the judgments of God are just and righteous altogether? We can talk about visions of divine retribution or divine punishment, perhaps Catherine would be interested in that, but note here that what you have here is a kind of understanding of compensation and a kind of compensation by way of 
vicarious suffering, that it's for the purpose, I think, <coughs> finally, of a discipline and a conversion to uh, reconciliation. So immediately after establishing that interpretation of the war, you have the final words, with malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right. An important, uh, important re reservation, which again harkens back to the beginning of the section. It's a standard move of Lincoln. We are firm in the right as God gives us to see the right. But we may not always see it. Right. Let us drive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's rooms, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and orphan. Now, that prayer, that prayer by which one seeks malice towards none, binding up the room, that's one in seeking union, which may be answered. The first one couldn't. This one could. Okay. So you have a certain understanding of a reserve against a reserve about pro, pro, providence. The theologian might call it an eschatological reserve um, that one can't control history. The, the righteous, uh, the, the, the righteous God has His own purposes, and there's a resistance to suggesting that one control, manage, or 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 um, bring to one side without. Um, uh, uh, self-criticism the causes uh, of God to support oneself now Reinhold Niebuhr actually um, cites this passage in developing his own thought and one of my conclusions is going to be that there's a very specific purpose to what Obama is doing insofar as he's engaging in a kind of public theology indebted to this, this, this particular tradition. But Niebuhr is widely regarded after Dr. Martin Luther King to be the most significant Protestant public theologian in America. He was a crucial uh, voice through the two world wars, um, during the civil rights movement, during the Cold War, uh, and some of his last writings were in severe criticism of American involvement in the war in Vietnam. Niebuhr is well known for a stance which has been called Christian realism, which wants to take seriously the prevalence and the ineradicable prevalence of sin in the world. And uh, that is a sinfulness that at the same time does not um, uh, evoke uh, a sense of cynicism or a sense of hopelessness regarding one's call to do justice in the world. But one does justice in the world humbly, uh, always trying to curb the self-righteousness to which one is always tempted to. Okay. Now the text that I provide here is a brief one from a book he wrote uh, during the Cold War in 1959 called The Children of Light and the Children of Darkness. And here you find some standard Niborian themes. There's an appeal to the world community, a, you know, actually the attainment of community in the family of humankind as being both a final possibility and impossibility. Right? Uh, that's again engaging this notion of a, we might say, an eschatological reserve. It is a possibility for us, but something that finally we could never attain perfectly. But our task of achieving that world community to establish uh, concord and harmony rather than division to establish some kind of tranquility of order. The task of achieving it has to be seen from the standpoint of a certain kind of faith. So the condition of the possibility for moral achievement in building community in the world requires a faith that presumes, one, that all human historical achievements are fragmentary in virtue of our finitude, in virtue of our limits, and the limits of the perspectives of all sides trying to pursue that. Secondly, it's a faith that all of all, all human achievements towards this goal are broken. All of them are subject to uh, criticism in terms of sin, or more specifically for Niebuhr, inordinate self-interest, that, uh, um, that, that excessive love of our own ideas and of our own projects uh, as they aggrandize us, um, that uh, affects and inflicts all efforts for justice. So a certain kind of faith in human limits and in human fallenness is the condition of the possibility for pursuing this task of building harmony in the world. And that faith also has confidence in 
the meaning of what it does achieve because the completion of, of the task of bringing harmony in the world belongs to a divine power. This God, our divine power, um, has resources which are greater than those of human beings, and it is a power whose suffering love can actually overcome these corruptions of excessive self-assertion, uh, the domination of the powerful over the weak, and so forth. So for Niebuhr, a notion of suffering love, which indirectly intervenes in history through, through acts of uh, self-giving or, or through acts which, which, which challenge one's own uh, self-righteousness. Trust in that, trust in the power of, of curbing one's excessive self-interest, denying oneself to see the other person's point of view, denying oneself even in sacrificial acts for the sake of justice. One has trust not in one's own power to do that, but in that divine power to which one may witness and do it. So there is, without a whole lot of specific theological language, you have basically a, a theological anthropology in the vision of providence, and at least an implicit Christology right there. Now, Dr. Martin Luther King seldom, at least in my reading of his writings, referred to Abraham Lincoln. But he crucially was indebted, and to some people, decisively indebted, to Reinhold Niebuhr. In fact, Taylor Branch, in, in, in his magisterial three-volume biography of King in, the, uh, in America, um, suggests that, 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 in a way, King's appeals to Gandhi was a public relations move to befriend, um, in the name of a commitment to nonviolent struggle, to befriend uh, uh, an American uh, population that wasn't so sure about this sort of thing. But that finally the strategy of nonviolent resistance was Niborian insofar it was only through struggles nonviolently that an oppressed minority, minority could secure justice which, of course, Niebuhr himself predicted was necessary for the American experience as, recently, as early as 1935. In any case, King, was, King knew Niebuhr's work. King wrote about Niebuhr as a graduate student um, and engaged his work. Uh, so there's a connection between Niebuhr and Lincoln and then between King and Niebuhr. The text I have here is a characteristic example of the way in which King would use different sources from culture um, African-American experience, Christian experience, and this doesn't include as much, but King would also use, of course, the American constitutional values of freedom and equality to bring together a sort of vision for the sake of prophetic witness and um, inspiration. So a standard move King would do would be to talk about psychology in the 50s and 60s, making a great deal of this notion of maladjustment. Child psychology was always worried about the problem of maladjustment. Uh, among children and adolescents and so forth. And King's trope was to say, let's all be creatively maladjusted. Let's all be creatively maladjusted, like the prophet Amos, who calls for justice to run down like the waters. Let's be creatively maladjusted, who says, like Lincoln, who could not countenance a nation being half slave and half free and knew that it could not stand. Let's all be maladjusted. Let's all engage in a kind of redemptive nonconformity like Jesus of Nazareth, who claimed astonishingly, love your enemies and bless those that curse you. It is through maladjustment that we will be able to emerge from the bleak and desolate midnight of man's humanity to man into the bright and glittering bright daylight of freedom and justice. And then you get the concluding words of the I Have a Dream speech, which King, in this case, delivered in a well-known commencement address called the American Dream at Lincoln University right here in Pennsylvania in 1961. So you get, so you get that. King would recycle these sorts of things um, uh, regularly. Okay, so there, is, there are the, the usual suspects in American public theology. And as I suggested, there's a connection between them. Now, I include a Catholic example here I will, uh, uh, and I, I, I would suggest um, that you find in John Paul II some parallel understanding of public theology. You can look at this text. This is from um, Pope John Paul II's World Day of Peace message in 2002. It is a remarkable text 
precisely because it is written in the wake of 9-11. It is a World Day of Peace message which is actually suggesting that the condition for peace is justice and that the condition for justice is forgiveness. No peace without justice, no justice without forgiveness. Note in this Catholic example that John Paul II is making a case for forgiveness that appeals to, if you will, both the divine source of revelation and the insights of reason. Right? It begins with an account of um, the forgiveness of Christ, which is our norm and model in Luke, but also insists that the significance of forgiveness is grasped in the light of human reasoning. And, he, and, and the Pope gives an account of how that is the case. All human beings cherish the hope of being able to start all over again and not remain forever shut up in their own mistakes and guilt. They want to raise their eyes to the future. But forgiveness as that fully personal act is needed by society. It is needed by families and groups and states and the international community itself. They need forgiveness in order to renew ties that have been sundered, go beyond sterile situations of mutual condemnation, and overcome the temptations to discrimination. In this statement about the necessities of forgiveness to secure justice in the world, in this statement, the Pope is calling upon both the victims of terror and the perpetrators of terror to risk this movement into the, into the space of forgiveness. That the victims of terror risk mercy. That the perpetrators of terror seek forgiveness. And this is a kind of public theology. It may strike Niebuhr as astonishingly unrealistic. But it is a sort of public theology which appeals to faith and reason um, and tries to draw some social implications from uh, an evangelical uh, and interpersonal uh, form of relation. Okay, so there are some examples of, um, of uh, public theology. Now to the case of Barack Obama. What do we make of him as a public theologian? As you may know, he's publicly candid about a specific journey to the Christian faith that he took and, and completed in some fashion through a kind of profession of explicit faith in Jesus Christ during his years as a union organizer in Chicago. Here, the, um, the impact of Reverend Jeremiah Wright uh, is inescapable. Uh, it was, I think, at Trinity United in Chicago where he made his explicit profession of faith, having been raised skeptical about religious matters um, with a father who uh, um, uh, was born a Muslim but that did not practice, and a mother uh, who um, herself was rather skeptical of organized religion, although Obama, of course, understands her to be deeply loving uh, and kind. So, in this journey to Christian faith, um, he... Um, um, uh, moves forward to a candidacy for the Senate, to a candidacy for the president, to the presidency. And in a number of significant public addresses, um, Obama has spoken Christian themes that resemble and resound with those of Lincoln, Niebuhr, and King. So, for Lincoln, Obama himself expresses that parallel reserve about our future under God. He expresses this parallel understanding um, that uh, a proper view of God's providence bars or resists any temptation to any excessive self-confidence in, in how history will go and in our power to control it. The crucial text here is from his inaugural address. The source of our confidence as a nation is that God calls us to shape an uncertain destiny. Does it talk about a manifest destiny? God calls us to shape an uncertain destiny. <coughs> but, the, but, the, but, the, but our confidence rests in that call to take that responsibility. In Obama's April 2009 address at Notre Dame, or I guess it was May 2009, the commencement address there, you get um, a similar theme. Um, Obama speaks at Notre Dame this way. It's beyond our capacity to know with certainty what God has planned for us and what he asks of us. And those of us who believe must trust that his wisdom is greater than our own. So again, and from there he makes a move 
that is implicit in Lincoln and explicit in Niebuhr. He goes on to say, and this should give us some ground for humility. This should give us some reason not to be self-righteous. That we really move towards an uncertain future. That God has planned it. We can't be sure how it's going to go. We trust in God's wisdom. One might say Lincoln-esque, in a Lincoln-esque way, the very wisdom which, 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 which um, uh, removed the, the woe of slavery uh, through a devastating war uh, and that now calls parties to reconcile uh, uh, with malice toward none and with charity for all. Okay, so this, again, this notion of a certain kind of hesitation or, 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 or humbling um, caution about being able to manage or control history or to bring the favor of the Almighty exclusively to one side over against others. That's a, Lincoln, that's a theme from Lincoln that you find crucially in the second part. Niebuhr. Well, Obama has written this about his favorite theologian, as some people say. I take away from Niebuhr's works the compelling idea that there's serious evil in the world and hardship and pain. And we should be humble and modest in our belief that we can eliminate those things. But we shouldn't use that as an excuse for cynicism and inaction. This in an interview with David Brooks that has gotten all kinds of play and you can find it online. Well, I'll tell you what. That's a pretty good description of the vision of Reinhold Niebuhr. Right? It's, it's, it's um, spot on. There's serious evil in the world. We should be humble in our presumptions to be able to solve it. For Niebuhr, political life is always a, 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 an attempt to engage proximate, was it, uh, proximate solutions to insoluble problems. Right? But we shouldn't use our sense of the limits of what we can achieve as a reason to uh, be cynical and just understand moral values, say, to be irrelevant to political achievement, or to be passive and not to act out of some despair. So neither cynicism nor despair is an option once we recognize our due limits in faith in that divine power whose wisdom is greater than ours. Here, um, you have uh, concessions to sin, but also the cautious hope for renewal and trust in the persisting power of moral values. Now, again, in the inaugural uh, address of President Obama, and here Thiemann, I think, is right, um, Obama writes, our power alone cannot protect us, nor does it entitle us to do as we please. Our power grows from prudent use, our security emanates from the justice of our cause, the force of our example, and the tempering qualities of humanity and restraint. Those are Niburian themes, I'd say. In the Notre Dame address, he speaks quite directly about the force of original sin and its impact. He talks about the imperfections of man, our selfishness, our pride, our stubbornness, our acquisitiveness, our insecurities, our egos, all the cruelties, large and small, that those of us in the Christian tradition understand to be rooted in original sin. Niebuhr always would claim famously that original sin was the one empirically verifiable <laughs> doctrine of the Christian faith. As a consequence of that kind of imperfection, Obama goes on in the Notre Dame address, the strong too often dominate the weak, and too many of those with wealth and with power find all manner of justification for their own privilege in the face of poverty and injustice. This could have been written by Reinhold Niebuhr in 1935 in, Im in Moral Man and in Moral Society. In addition now, there's a certain rhetorical, and, and here I'm on, here I'm on, I'm, I may not be on solid ground, but I see in perhaps his greatest religious reflection, I see a kind of rhetorical resonance and rhetorical brilliance characteristic of King and I'd say the African-American homiletic tradition. This is a tradition which seems to engage everyday images that are pregnant with theological and spiritual meaning and engages them for the purpose of developing them to greater richness and deeper effect. 
I think here of King's, I think, February 1968 sermon, which I, I believe was at Ebenezer Baptist, called The Drum Major Instinct. Sections of that sermon were, 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 were uh, either read, yeah, were read, I believe, on the occasion of King's funeral service in April. The drum major instinct begins from an account of the drum major instinct. That is, that, that instinct we all have to, to be first, you know, to be ahead of somebody, right? To, uh, to be the big noise, as C.S. Lewis characterized the, skin, the sin of pride, right? To, 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 to establish a certain kind of superiority. The drum major instinct is finally a sermon about the sin of pride, where the drum major instinct is just that. And in the sense that I think Lewis meant it in his own informality precisely, the desire to be the big noise. Now, the sermon goes on to invoke the example of Christ who says, you want to be first? Good. You want to lead? Good. You want to be the big noise? Good. Then serve the poor. Right? First among, us, first among you shall be the last. Right? And so it concludes with those famous words of Kings. So if I'm going to be a drum major... Let them know that I was a drum major for justice. Let them know that I was a drum major for the poor. Let them know I was a drum major for love. Now that image just resounds and goes and goes and goes. And it's exceedingly powerful. And again, there's a, there's a theology implicit in all this, I would say, involving conversion from pride. I mean, repentance from pride and conversion to love. Now, the text in the handout from Obama is again from the Notre Dame speech. And here I'm going to read it. I'm going to read it, and then I have a brief conclusion. And I see this in the legacy of the, of, of the African-American pulpit tradition, and certainly in the legacy of the kind of um, uh, preaching that uh, is representative of King, and indeed of Jeremiah Wright. Of course, this is a commencement address, but let's go. King's, uh, uh, Obama's commencement address was on the 55th anniversary of the, pa of the uh, Supreme Court decision in Brown versus Board of Education. And he cites that. And so it's in the context of citing the anniversary and discussing the civil rights movement that this goes forward. So I'll read this. There were freedom rides and lunch counters and billy clubs, and there was also a civil rights commission appointed by President Eisenhower. It was the 12 resolutions recommended by this commission that would ultimately become law in the Civil Rights Act of 1964. There were six members of the commission. It included five whites and one African American, Democrats and Republicans, two Southern governors, the dean of a Southern law school, a Midwestern University president, and your own father, Ted Hesburg, president of Notre Dame. They worked for two years, and at times, President Eisenhower had to intervene personally, since no hotel or restaurant in the South would serve the black and white members of the commission together. Finally, when they reached an impasse in Louisiana, Father Ted flew them all to Notre Dame's retreat in Land of Lakes, Wisconsin, where they eventually overcame their differences and hammered out a final deal. Years later, President Eisenhower asked Father Ted how on earth he was able to broker an agreement between men of such different backgrounds and beliefs. And Father Ted simply said that during their first dinner in Wisconsin, they discovered that they were all fishermen. And so he quickly readied a boat for a, twi a twilight trip out on the lake. They fished, and they talked, and they changed the course of history. I will not pretend that the challenges we face will be easy, or that the answers will come quickly, or that all our differences and divisions will fade happily away. Life is not that simple. It never has been. But as you leave here today, remember the lessons of Cardinal Bernardine, of Father Hesburgh, of movements for change, both large and small. Remember that each of us, endowed with the dignity possessed, possessed by all children of God, has the grace to recognize ourselves in one another, to understand that we all seek the same love of family and the same fulfillment of a life well lived. Remember that in the end, we are all fishermen, if nothing else, that knowledge should give us faith that through our collective labor and God's providence and our willingness to shoulder each other's burdens, America will continue on its precious journey towards that more perfect union. Now, of course, an invocation of Lincoln at the very end. Well, the image of the fisherman is, I think, astonishing. And it's precisely a community building, but also an evangelical moment. 
so far as it is evocative of a call to discipleship. Uh, and I see that to be, if you will, his, his, his finest achievement in this kind or this genre or this rhetoric um, of public theology. Okay. Um, here's how I'll conclude. Obama represents or is a part of a limited tradition of American public theology. It's a tradition that I sketched in my early remarks involving Lincoln, King, Niebuhr. That line continues. The suggestion that he is part of a tradition that includes Baldwin, Locke, and Madison, even if you could characterize any of them as public theologians, and perhaps you could, strikes me as unpersuasive. What is more, it's not clear to me, as Thiemann suggests, that he is, that Obama is setting out to be a public theologian for America. Here's all I could say. He has engaged that tradition when he has engaged it, and, and he may continue to engage it for a very specific purpose. It is indeed a purpose we can characterize as to try to enlist in the national spirit an act of repentance and conversion. The act of repentance is from a divisive and arrogant American exceptionalism that believes it can control and manage history, on the one hand. And on the other hand, it is a repentance from partisan political division in which parties to either side demonize one another. Now, in the preceding administration, dare I say, God was invoked for those purposes too. So George W. Bush could be understood as a public theologian of sorts as well. The conversion, that to which we turn after that repentance, and for the purpose of which Obama, I would suggest, from what I've seen, has engaged this tradition, this is con a conversion to seeking common ground and reconciliation to the discovery of a common humanity in shared struggles for the common good, and to enrich a, the pursuit of that through a more modest, humble, measured um, understanding of our place on the world stage, even as the, exemplar, the exemplary figure and the leader of the world stage. So I see his being a public theologian for a specific purpose, which is not to say this is merely pragmatic at all, but that seems to me to be the fairest, most um, uh, precise way to make this case. Now, two quick side notes. You should know that following the Notre Dame address, if not before, Catholics have been trying to get into the act. So in an article written by John O'Malley, uh, the author of a uh, much discussed and excellent book called What Happened at Vatican II, you have um, the author suggesting that in Barack Obama we find a, um, a Vatican II president. A Vatican II president insofar as the spirit of Vatican II was one of civility to seek dialogue, seek overcoming false division, to seek cooperation and harmony among the, the bishops with one another and between the church and the world. <clears throat> so O'Malley writes, when I heard Obama's speeches, I was struck by how much he spoke in accord with the spirit of Vatican II. He called for civility, for the end of name calling, and for a willingness to work together to deal with our common problems. In the Notre Dame address, he also invokes the image of one human family, a characteristic Roman Catholic theme. So Catholics are now uh, in, on the, uh, in on the discussion. But I'll end with this. In 2006, and this is for you, Greg. In 2006, in an important address on faith and politics, an address which um, I guess uh, then Senator Obama uh, gave to uh, the call to renewals, building a covenant for a new America. It was a call to renewal. In there, Obama criticized his fellow progressives for their secularism, for distancing or wanting nothing to do with religious discourse in political life. But at the same time as he did that, he writes this. 
democracy demands that the religiously motivated translate their concerns into universal rather than religious specific values. It requires that their proposals be subject to argument and amenable to reason. I may be opposed to abortion for religious reasons, but if I seek to pass a law banning the practice, I cannot simply point to the teachings of my church or evoke God's will. I have to explain why abortion violates some principle that is accessible to peoples of all faiths, including those with no faith at all. Now, on the face of it, that might be a perfectly reasonable position, and one that perhaps Catholics might find quite congenial. But just as there are certain kinds of claims that Obama has made that could be written by Reinhold Niebuhr in 1935, this paragraph, <laughs> this paragraph could not have, and this paragraph might find a place in John Rawls's controversial right. defense right. of public reason, where Rawls seems to place a condition on the use of religious language. That is, you can use your religious language on condition that you give a, an account more universally. Now again, perhaps in a Roman Catholic vision of faith and reason, this is a non-problem. But I should note that at least in 2006, you have that theme. And in fact, he, he, he a bit more quietly sounds it again in the Notre Dame address. So just notice that, just to say maybe two and a half years for Barack Obama on this one. Okay. So thanks. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah. Um, it, 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 the fact that the media, I mean, everything that's said now is just communicated so instantaneously, is that positive or a negative for, the you know, for these times as it relates to a public theologian? Like, well, what's on, what's on your mind when you ask that question? No, no, you know, I, I mean, because, like, I remember the, the some of your know, King's speeches, right. which particularly the drum major, when he talks about James and John, how they right. want to be first, that, I mean, if those things can get out there quicker, it seems like it should have a more positive impact, but yet now it's like when they get out there, it's like more people rush to attack it than it seems to support it. And 24 hours later, you're on a new news cycle. Yeah. Okay, well, sure, that would. So that's right. I suppose a, con a condition for the possibility of public theology actually actually um, seeping into or shaping an ethos would be limited by at least the, the pace and the character of the media. I mean, I'd, I'd, yeah. I'd say that. But, may have, uh, but uh, probably the, have the more people, and how, system. it seems like no one, it's hard to, it gets out there so fast that, and the argument starts to assume that we often don't have a chance to sit back and reflect, like, okay, what is, you know, what is he, saying that how does it impact me or how does it really impact society? Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, it just gets tied up before we really get a chance to... Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's an issue about the media of the media. How about the substance of the media, media. too? I mean, insofar as you're delivering the news, you're delivering it, I suppose, given the current media with spins <laughs> yeah. that um, um, uh, um, could often stand in place of thought. Yeah, <laughs> right. Well, it's partisan spins. Yeah, partisan spins. You know, you know. I can imagine somebody saying he's evoking God here, but he's you know, but you progressives don't let us. You progressives don't let us talk about God our way. Yeah, or something like that. I could imagine. But because it's in the public domain so quickly, it seems like it, it should give you know every citizen the right to kind of sit back and reflect. But it often doesn't <laughs> happen that way. Have any of you reflected on this? Yes, Laura? I think to a certain point you're discounting your own individuality. I mean, the way, I mean, I see what you're talking about. I mean, the minute he delivers, before he even delivered the Notre Dame speech, everyone's attacking him. Oh my God, he's going to a Catholic school. Oh my God, why are they letting him come? Oh my God, he's a baby killer. But at the same time, I watched the speech, and before I, I mean, I, of course, during the speech, of course, no one's talking, but right after, oh my God, what did he say? Yeah. But, I mean, you have your own time. You watch the speech. You can turn CNN off. You can turn the TV off and think about it for yourself. Yes, the news is more than willing to do it for you, but they don't refuse to allow you to do it yourself. I think oh, you're no, discounting yeah, yeah. your own individuality there. Mm -hmm. oh, you have to want to do it yourself. No one's forcing you to. But things are different now than they were 40 years ago. Well, yes, right. but 
I don't mm -hmm. know what it was like 40 years ago. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I have nothing to compare it to, oh. is what I'm trying to say. Oh, yeah. I have nothing to compare People it to. People smoke really <laughs> slowly. All I, have, all I have is now. Well, I mean, isn't this a case of what exactly what Obama's asking for, this kind of civility of discourse? Um, you know, it's... it's uh, the fact that you have to have the President of the United States ask for civility of discourse tells you how low we've become, because you would think that would be a, a, a no-brainer, you know. Um, not for not, Joe and, Wilson. And, huh? Not for Joe Wilson. <laughs> right, right. Mm. But I mean, not that, and, and, I, and I, don't, <coughs> I don't mean by that to su su suggest that in Lincoln's day it was completely civil, okay. you know, because oh, I mean, he got, he got, <laughs> oh, people right, got, so, but the, people got the caned point, on the, right, on so it's not, floor. it's part of the human condition to, um, I would submit to, uh, be in civil, mm -hmm. when power's at play, mm -hmm. when power's at stake, mm -hmm. so, um, but I, you know, I think we need, to, I need, I think there needs to be the cultivation of new kinds of habits for those of us who take this kind of stuff seriously, mm -hmm. and, um, to, and to create different kinds of uh, practices, uh, both socially and, and, and institutionally, say, in a place like Villanova, where people can slow down and really be paying attention to things. Because it, it's, you're right, it's an individual choice, but if your social structures around you don't support that individual choice, it's likely you won't take it. You know what I mean? Like, so we need to create spaces like this, where people can actually slow down enough and really pay attention to what, even someone they might disagree with pay attention to what that person's saying because maybe they have something fruitful to offer that actually benefit me. But that takes that humility that you, you talked about, that that that, that trio, uh, if you include the Pope as well as for, that foursome, have talked about this need for some humility. Um, sure. You know, God forbid that uh, we might be wrong. Well, there it is. I mean, right. I mean, I mean, again, coming out of a certain kind of Protestant or evangelical context, I will invoke Kierkegaard here, but I mean, I mean, with typical magnificent hyperbole, I mean, but perhaps theological insight, you know, the famous line is, it is a consoling thought that all of us are always in the wrong. <laughs> Mark. Uh, all of your, your figures here share a certain, certain sort of theological brand. Right. And I, I'm just wondering if, if there's a counter-narrative Mm -hmm. There's a, the, the other side mm -hmm. of public theology, mm -hmm. sort of embedded in the social gospel mm -hmm. uh, vision, and who those figures might be, mm -hmm. and sort of how they lead up then into the contemporary conversation. Good, good. Um, let me say, I, I hadn't figured the, the point I'm going to make out before saying it during my remarks. And so now you realize that I'm going to say something to you, and I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, but. As I was finishing this, I'm saying, am I charting a tradition of public theology? Well, yes, insofar as people characterize it. Or am I charting, if you will, a counter-narrative to traditional American civil religion? See? Oh, maybe I should have said that, but I was, yeah, okay. So, so I mean, Lincoln, my God. I mean, the, 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 the I mean, the, get, uh, the, uh, the Lincoln Memorial is characteristically described as the shrine of American civil religion. Right? And these folks in the legacy, one way or the other. Yes, yeah, so I would say that. And then there would be perhaps so, so a more critical American civil religion coming out of this. Okay? So that would be one way to address your question. It, it might itself be a counter-narrative to something different. But with respect to a political theology, uh, a public theology as represented in the social gospel movement, well, you know, Niebuhr is still at the crossroads of that, severely critical of the social gospel as being sentimental and idealistic, but certainly carried forward its, uh, its commitment to social justice in a Christian realist idiom. Um, yet, um, uh, Niebuhr um, um, uh, had other uh, colleagues, uh, such as John Bennett um, and others, who um, had uh, progressive commitments to social justice, but understood their own um, uh, realism, perhaps, to uh, uh, be um, um, more hopeful than Niebuhr's. 
And actually, it even was in con conversation with a number of <laughs> Roman Catholics uh, of pacifist strife, James Douglas and so forth, who he don't be very critical of. But um, um, there could be a counter narrative to the to the counter narrative uh, that um, that is not only directed towards here, but also to the social gospel and Roman Catholic critical reflection. So yeah, that would be very very interesting. Be very very interesting to lay that out. I mean, help me out with respect to that counter narrative. You must have some others in mind. I mean, we're talking Rausch and Bush. We're talking Washington Gladden. We're talking about Niebuhr's presence. But in the wake of that, I mean, uh, well, that's what, in terms of carrying it forward, I don't know. I, I sometimes wonder if if certain pieces of the neoconservative uh, framework, mm -hmm. to put it to put it generously, uh, embodies some of that. I mean, it's the manifest destiny. It's the uh, belief in inevitable progress. The conquest of democracy and justice mm -hmm. in earthly terms. Right, right, right. And then right. the sort of rejection of the relative justice and a sense of you know sort of absolute divine justice. That That's right. That's right. But Niebuhr, Niebuhr was Niebuhr at least on the Protestant side was an uh, unyielding critic of all of that. Mm -hmm. At the same time, he might have given he might have lost some of the he might have lost some of the uh, other sort of prophetic possibility that was present in Rauschenbusch and Bush right. in doing that, right? Which actually I think. Analogously, Roman Catholic reflection, at least in the wake of the Second Vatican Council, has 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 taken up. I mean, again, that you know that vision, you know, to to answer the kingdom of God on earth that Rauschenbusch, uncritically or undialectically espoused. Although he's always misread on that, um, including Niebuhr. I mean, he, Reinhold was trying to make his bones, so he distorted another's position. Um, but um, you know, I think. The eschatological proviso in post-Vatican II Roman Catholic social thought uh, could be understood, at least structurally, to be uh, in spirit of the social gospel. <clears throat> could be understood that way. Yeah. Uh, I'm just curious, with regard to the candidate versus President Obama, uh -huh. um, on this issue of humility, I'm wondering if you see a difference. Um, maybe because certainly you could argue, you know, his candidacy was one of the least humble um, you know, we've ever witnessed this whole notion of transformation and change. Um, so I'm just wondering if that is true, if you see a difference, or mm -hmm. if this change is always commensurate with what he's doing now. Okay, you and I may, you and I may see that, that differently. Um, yeah. You and I may see that differently. Yes, the commitment to change was palpable. Uh, um, but it was a commitment to change where hope was, where, where one was called upon to, to hope and overcome fear. I thought that was always part of it. Uh, now maybe that maybe the news cycle didn't carry that forward. Uh, maybe I maybe in fact I'm missing something that you're seeing. But I always thought that the notion of limits and modesty, sure, in a, in in I think may well have been uh, uh, less present during it. But I never thought he lost the sense of change and transformation, um, uh, being um, one that understood the limits of, that tried to take more seriously the limits of American power, the cost of excessive reliance on American power, the cost, on, the cost of excessive presumption of American insight and wisdom. So I always thought that was part of the criticism. So um, I thought actually what you were going to speak to was something else, which was which is say that uh, where I, 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 if, if you do think this, I, I might share this, this a little bit more. Uh, there is an interesting question about whether the modesty that I suggested and the modesty that I see present, at least in these addresses, um, um, uh, belies or, or, or is at odds with uh, the way in which Obama's candidacy at times appeared to be about Barack Obama. Right. right. Now, yeah. If it's I mean, in a sense, it had to be about Barack Obama given the situation. But but you don't you know what I'm saying? You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. Yes. I'd like to ask a broader question about public theology because I want to be convinced of its greatness, but I'm not. Uh, and the first thought was uh, following the civility comments. I find that uh, what seems uncivil in my opponents. So, for instance, the town hall meetings of later, the you lie comment seems like just a paragon of uh, civility. It seems when everything's at stake for me uh, to be absolutely necessary responses, which leads me to my criticism of public theology, at least in the vein that you've sort of set up for us. It seems to be both reductive and idealistic. 
so you were talking about justice, and uh, the one that jumps out at you is, is, is John Paul II, and I, I want to be John Paul II. I want to be forgiveness. Yes, that's what's key. You know, or God doesn't take sides in our Abraham Lincoln speech. But at the same time, isn't restitution also a function of justice? I mean, is justice merely, let's have sort of a smoking jacket kind of theology and we'll all be civil and come to some kind of a, you know, compromise and be good pragmatists? Or does justice demand something else beyond a sort of pragmatic consensus? Does yeah, it demand I... a restitution on one hand? And on the second hand, is it too reductive? Does it presume a homogeneity that isn't there? I think you've caricatured the position I presented. I'm totally caricatured. Okay. Yo, okay. Yeah, I oh, I see. And that's civil, right? <laughs> ah, that's civil. I get it now. So you caricature one another's position, you fight it out, and you, you probably make no progress whatsoever. Well, let's call it rhetoric. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, no, I think that's a caricature. I mean, okay. I mean, sure, the Niborian, uh, a standard stock and trade attack on Niebuhr is that he's merely a pragmatist. Uh, one could apply that to Lincoln and with respect to the suspension of habeas corpus. And certainly Obama, who sounds just like Appiah, I uh, think. Well, it, well, okay, we could talk about that uh, in, 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 at another time. Um, and that might not be entirely bad, by the way, in my judgment. But I, I, yeah, I don't think that um, this kind of smoking jacket vision is at all fair. I mean, Link, uh, the second inaugural does establish that it's odd that the, the supporters of the institution of slavery would invoke God for their own benefit. The issue is, you don't then demonize in this situation, let's not judge so we not be judged. He clearly is committed to moral values. He's clearly committed that, there are, that, that, that there's an object of moral truth. It just has to do how do we, this side of the cross, work with that. And that does not rule out prophetic indictment. It does not rule out hammering things out. Civility does hardly involves um, this hardly involves a kind of um, um, you know, coming together over sherry and cigars to kind of work out something for us fellow powerful people. No, it's precisely the kind of recognition that uh, the pursuit of justice matters, that the Almighty has his own purposes, and that it involves an objective kind of character, but we can't appropriate that for ourselves without self-criticism, humility, and listening to the other guy. So I don't think that that's excessively reductive. I certainly don't think that the tradition I, I uh, identified as idealistic, not that tradition. Um, I don't think so at all. I mean, I don't see what uh, the later development of King. I mean, the drum major instinct, the drum major instinct, I think, represent a significant change in King's reflection from the earlier sermons and the earlier emphases on Gandhi and so on and so forth. So yeah, I don't think so. I think there's more, at the very least, more room for maneuver. I think it, I think it is reductive to re reduce this tradition of pragmatism as well. Yeah? Well, I mean, this gets to what you were trying to, s to say at the end about that it's invoked at certain times. Well, right? that's my I mean, point, yeah. That that it's not, but but not in a, a sort of utilitarian way, but... Uh, not in a merely pragmatist right, way. Right, But saying that there's, um, th that you emphasize these themes of reconciliation at the point where this demonization, this division, is uh, is what needs to be responded to. Mm -hmm. most that That is what needs to be responded to with the prophetic voice. Mm -hmm. And that at other times, the prophetic voice will require attention to other elements that are are at odds. Uh, I mean, so, and, so I, I don't know, that, that's one thing. I, I, I still want to think about how that, how that works um, and in terms of public theology, trying to identify the, the right times and the right way and the right people to address. Right, I mean, again, I, I, what I'm trying to do is to take that highfalutin thing that Ron Thiemann wrote and, and, and suggest he's half right. right. That's kind of yeah. what this was about. Yeah, yeah. This was this was what it's about. It's not clear to me that he that that Obama is is means to be a public theologian right. for America. Right. Maybe he does esteem himself so much that he would take on that mantle. Certainly Lincoln didn't. <laughs> you know, Lincoln had a war to win. But I means to suggest that strikes me as excessive. And then to link him with his broader tradition, it's just unpersuasive. I mean, Brett can't even imagine how John Locke could be a public theologian. But, um, but so, so I'm not trying to say that this is calculated and cynical. Right. But I am trying to suggest, what shall I say? I mean, insofar as a, a, a kairos presents itself, mm -hmm. 
Right. Uh, there is an there is an American historical moral traditions. This either public theology or perhaps better counter narrative to a, a civil religion which has gone um, went, which for Obama ran amok in the preceding administration, or at least for many of us ran amok. And Obama perhaps was the person we we, we latched onto to kind of give the lie yeah. to that position. Yeah. And I guess so. One question tied into that is that how does I mean, public, the, the, the notion of public theology that, I mean, if someone approached Lincoln with the notion of public theology, <laughs> I mean, because we're talking about underlying pre presuppositions about the re relationship between church and state, right? Between right. where religion can fit mm -hmm. in the public sphere. Mm -hmm. So in some way, we need to take account of the evolution of what that groundwork even allows for to understand what public theology would look like for Lincoln versus yeah, and that that, but so, but not saying that that uh, precludes the possibility of it. But I think it yeah. has something to do with this need to not to to choose the times. Yeah, yeah. And look, I mean, in this respect, I I do agree with Jessica. And I'm not making nice, Jessica. I do agree with Jessica. I don't like I don't like the term public theology. I remember how I be, oh you didn't hear what I began. I didn't. Yeah, okay. I mean, what bothered me about Ron Thiemann's blog was that he linked the tradition that Obama represented, and he's a young guy, right? I mean, so what tradition is he a part of? He linked that tradition, not just to Lincoln, okay, but to Locke, Madison, James Baldwin, and MLK, and Dr. King, okay? Um, and I said, and I, as I said before you came in, I said, I asked myself if everybody's a public theologian, then nobody. And so I wanted to explore exactly what I could come up with. So you know, I'm even crazy about the term. The term actually strikes me as perhaps forged in a certain defensiveness, right? A certain defensiveness against those who said, well, your theology has nothing, your theology has nothing to do with public life. Oh, no, 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 it does. We do public theology, right? right? And so there's a certain defensiveness about that. And then that defensiveness, I think, and here I think Stanley Hauerwas' critique of a book like Fullness of Faith is finally excessive and polemical, <laughs> but there's, there's, there's a grain of truth to it, which is that there is a danger in all of a sudden, if in fact public theology is a vision forged in defensiveness, because you put me on the defensive as if my faith has nothing to do with politics, then if it's forged in a certain kind of defensiveness, then you'll be defensive in the way you execute it. And then you will risk a certain kind of accommodation to the menu of everyday social policies that the Democratic and Republican Party present. Okay, maybe this is where you're getting that too, partly. If it is, okay, we, we, we share common ground. <gasps> there, I use that word. We share common ground there too. We share common ground there. So, so I don't even like the term that much. Right? Yeah. I don't even like the term that much for the reasons I suggested. Yeah, you were going to speak to this, weren't oh. you? I, I gave you the, the Hauerwas century, yeah, didn't well, there's I? Yeah. Two, there's, there's two thoughts, and I'm not clear how they're connected. Mm -hmm. One thing is, insofar as theology is a discipline grounded in a community of faith, how, how, what does it mean for a public theologian who's, who's, if Obama's a public theologian, he's not speaking out of any particular community? I don't know. So, it, so, so there's, yeah. there's so I'm, I'm coming on the your discomfort with the word public theology because theology is a discipline that some would argue, absolutely comes is is practiced by a person coming out of a community. So right. it's not like I'm just off by myself thinking about theology. <laughs> exactly. I, you know, I'm, I, you know. Anyway, Fair so enough. that's Fair one enough. comment. The other comment had to do yeah. with Harawas and Yoder and Michael Baxter and people like that who. Who uh, Michael Baxter's at Notre Dame talking about um, like Niebuhr, Niebuhr's idea that somehow the the that somehow I can be in, as a Christian I can be engaged in um, properly humble I can be engaged in the in politics um, and somehow that's um, somehow that's a realization of my Christian vocation. Would seem to be fly in the face of this other tradition. To, to speak of other traditions like, that Mark was bringing up, so sure. this is the social gospel tradition. But then there's the there's sure. the kind of the the Yoder uh, Mennonite tradition right. or, or Anabaptist tradition, which would just check out of politics altogether and not understand that as right. a Christian, right. even a legitimate Christian quest. Right. So right. Um, good. So I'm just wondering. Okay, good. That's wondering. Good. That's great. It, I mean, is okay. you mentioned how was, So I would take it that uh, you would you would agree that. This whole conversation, they would consider illegitimate. 
like to try to identify these people as public theologians. I think Stanley would say that they're on the wrong track. Even yeah, they're, if they're on trying the wrong, to do public they're theology. They're on the wrong track. Yeah. Um, and he'd, he'd say, he'd say, you know, spend all that time talking about public theology. <laughs> But you were right. You were right when the, you were right when the camera ran off. This ain't, this ain't about public theology. This is about goddamn American civil religion. Yeah, that's what you're saying. Right. And he may be right about that. <laughs> okay. But you know, I'm, I was working with this. So with respect to your question, as far as the community of faith goes, I don't know where he goes after Trinity. But he was actively involved at Trinity. Yeah. So I don't know. You know, I don't know what his deal is now. Uh, but I, but I would agree. Remember those definitions. I did I did have a purpose with those definitions because those right, definitions, right. defensive or undefensive, are right. trying to talk about as being evangelical, right. confessional. Obviously, they're looking over the shoulder, saying this is no, this is really all about Christ, Christ accommodating culture. This is the Christ <laughs> of culture. No, it doesn't. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. Okay. Um, <laughs> no, it isn't. It's confessional. It's evangelical. You know, we need this for the fullness of faith. So I'm aware of the question. I appreciate it. The second thing about involvement in politics, I'm thinking of, of Laura and, and Jeffrey in, in, in our discussions of, of, of Luther, uh, Luther's politics. I mean, yeah. Um, what would it mean to be involving yourself in politics if, in fact, the tradition includes the suggestion uh, that, as Luther says, if there's a shortage of hangmen, if there's yeah. a shortage of if there's a shortage of hangmen, then out of love of neighbor, become a hangman. You know, if there's a shortage of soldiers, then out of love of neighbor, become a soldier and love kill and pillage with you know with enthusiasm. Now again, no, none of these folks would have claimed that. And Luther, <laughs> this Luther, this Luther never hyperbolic. gave up an opportunity to be hyperbolic. Hyperbolic, <laughs> right, right, right. But I mean, it's true. I mean, at least analo analogously, or uh, analogously. Um, one would have to worry about whether all kinds of questions are being begged in a public theology that somehow s would s still presume that um, that social justice in the world is at the very least carried not just by the church and not even primarily by the church but in some kind of tandem with the political order or the state. Yes, I could imagine the suggestion that, that this language begs all kinds of questions. All right? I mean, one reason that Fullness of Faith was so attacked by Stanley and his minions was the cover of Fullness of Faith. Have you ever seen the cover? Oh, what was the cover? I have a copy. What is it? The Washington Monument. Oh, right. So this is a Christian theological reflection, but somebody from Paulist Press <laughs> decided to put the frickin' Washington <laughs> Monument on this. Yeah, but the right. Himes brothers had to approve that. If they really you know fought them. it, if they really <laughs> fought it, they could have gotten another picture. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that I think is so interesting, Don't though, judge a book by about <laughs> Way to go, Catherine. There you go. <laughs> One of the things I find interesting about this, and it, it, it kind of it hit me, in the, it really struck me as I was even looking at the dates here on Niebuhr's death. Uh, do you recall what, what happened in 1971? I believe that's the original publication date of A Theory of Justice. Yes. And it's kind of right. funny yes, to realize that this is, you know, the, the example you're giving us is kind of a post Rawlsian um, public theologian. And the kinds of questions that we're asking here those of us who are theologically educated and kind of struggling with, you know, Obama's relationship to this long-standing tradition of, of the invocation of, of religious Im imagery and themes and so on in public life, and how to think about it, is, is utterly, I think, shifted in, in our current culture as a result of the work of thinkers like Rawls and, and, and people that followed after Rawls. Mm -hmm. So that, that even when Obama reflects on this later, He's more concerned with how does he justify what he's doing, given the Rawlsian constraints on public reason. Right. Though that's what he has to, you know, kind of account for. And is this justified? Is this reasonable? Can I, you know, is what I'm doing okay as a public figure, as a president, as a politician? Yeah. Whereas, I mean, I mean, here so far that hasn't been our main concern. I mean, we're no. not really wrestling with that. We're wrestling with, you know, again, what kind of theologian is this and what kind of activity is this right. um, and, and, and is, it, is it a legitimate theological form or activity I, I don't know what to say but I just I find it striking I mean to really to really begin thinking about what it what are the possibilities for prophetic and, and theological speaking 
in a kind of post Rawlsian cultural setting. You know what I mean? And I, mean, and I think it's neat that he's trying it, but I also think that it's just like trying to do um, um, constructive theology after Kant, trying to do public theology after Rawls. I, I think it, it, it's, it's really deeply infected and, and kind of it, 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 set, it set really limits in terms of what mm -hmm. the speaker themselves can do or thinks they can do and what the audience themselves mm -hmm. are willing to hear and, and, and wrestle with. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, at some point when you were kind of going through it, I just, it, it really did strike me that we're hearing this, or at least, and again, not us exactly, we're having a different conversation here, but I think that the, the, a lot of the, the public reception and the public wrestling with this is is very different, and the kind of questions that would be raised about what Obama's doing are very different from what would have been asked about King or Niebuhr or Lincoln or anyone else in their own settings prior to this kind of Rawlsian switch. I, 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 thank you. I think that I, I think that's a fair question. I'll just add this in addition to, to thicken the plot. Um, Seventy-one. Okay, you had the sixties. The sixties, I suppose, has been identified by the sociologists as 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 sounding the death knell to the third kind of Christian establishment in America. Right? We started out legally disestablished. The wave of immigration, right? culturally disestablished us. But in the 60s, all hell broke loose. And so now you lost moral establishment. That's a kind of stock and trade vision. So insofar as Christian discourse, morally, culturally, and, and, and originally legally, is no longer the going currency. I mean, it's no surprise that I'm talking about Protestants with respect to Protestants here. There's an additional problem. Right? There's an additional question about, about this. Now, again, I think that the highest point and maybe the only point left in Obama's career as whatever this is, let's just call it public theology and follow and, and give all due honor to Thiemann and to others on the imminent frame who are happy to use that language. I think it's interesting that the place he, the, the place he hit the apogee was at a Roman Catholic institution. Because mm -hmm. there you don't have you may have all kinds of other disestablishments, but you don't have that one. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you don't have that one. I mean, I think he, you know? he, he was speaking to an audience that, that, that could hear right. some of these themes and, and, and see them as, as a perfectly natural conversation to be engaged in. Okay, so you would agree with that. Yeah. 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 Um, in a way that, again, a broader pub public audience, uh, I think, we, we can't okay. hear it. I mean, we... Fair enough. We don't know what to do with it. I mean, uh, yeah, we, as many of us have enough, maybe religion and, and, and theological, back, just you know, kind of talking about the American population in general, that they can hear it. And they kind of know what, he, what, it, what, what, the, what it's referring to, but it's not. It it, it, it it creates dissonance. I mean, I think they struggle to know how do I reconcile the the, the metaphors and and what what, I, what what's being invoked here with this understanding of public reason and public discourse that has to be utterly stripped of this for it to be legitimate. And Obama himself is wrestling with that. The imperfections of man are selfishness, pride, stubbornness, acquisitiveness, insecurities, egos. By the way, that list is a hell of a list. Hmm. I mean, he, he wouldn't stop. And I think that's pretty seven interesting. Seven <laughs> seven One, two, three, four, five, six. All the cruelties, large and small, that those of us in the Christian tradition understand to be rooted in original sin. Are you suggesting that those not rooted in the Christian tradition that just go, well, and you stop or, listening? Or, I mean, it just, it, I think there would be, again, a kind of... What? He listens them first, so you recognize Oh, that's right, yourself. he lists them first, okay. And yeah. then he says, by the way, there's a language that might be... Yeah, okay. yeah. Well, just, I even think, again, I, 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 just, I run into it even in the classroom here. Yeah, I was going to say. You start to draw upon here. these, and it's like, yeah, well, too. but we're not all Catholic. Or, oh, well, but... Gotcha. You know, we're not all Christian. Yeah, we're not all Christian, uh, and so this isn't yeah, really relevant. You have students read an encyclical, and they're like, well, but we can't really use this. It's not appropriate for public discourse. Or it's, it's impractical. Like, it's impractical. <laughs> and, and so it's, you know, no one, no one who was listening to Lincoln speaking would have... <laughs> That wouldn't have occurred to them at all. This would have been uh, an attempt to play on certain chords and, and, and images. Mystic chords of memory. Well, it's not even, I don't even mean that it's simply a, a, a loss of oh, profound sure. metaphors. But oh, it's I know. a real inability to see these, 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 these concepts and ideas and this language 
as being relevant in a direct way for public life. Yeah, and he really does. I mean, there are all kinds of ways in which he's acknowledging that quietly, and he has to make certain choices. I mean, he'll never say we are no longer a Christian nation. We are Christian, Protestant, Jewish, Muslim, Hindu. He'll say we are no longer only a Christian nation. We are a Jewish nation. We are a Muslim nation. That's how he does that. But and that's yeah. certainly true. And, and, and anything out of the Catholic tradition could say all that without any problem that's either. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, that's the thing that, I, that again, was striking when you read it, where he, he made the roles. He, he still is battling with that roles in the sense that if you want to take these ideas and bring them into a conversation about abortion or euthanasia, about anything else, it's got to be translated into kind of a universal language that is, that is, that is subject to this Public reason, not in the sense, I mean, it's not as if the Catholic Church doesn't have an account of public reason. There's lots of... Uh, of, of sure. Uh, but that it's a very, um, again, Kantian, Rawlsian sure. understanding of public reason. Right it's after, reason. in the Notre Dame Address, right after that, um, I believe, Lincolnian, Niborian, and by the way, Niebuhr explicitly discusses the second uh, inaugural in a number of places, and particularly and most famously at the end of the irony of American history, which is a hot book these days in, in American political... Uh, theory um, led by Andrew Basevich, who sees this to be the most important book written about American foreign policy ever. But after this account of this, this Niborian Lincolnian account of, of 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 God's planning for us um, being, but God's plans for us being elusive, and that 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 should humble us, it should temper our passions, we should be wary of self righteousness. After all that, he says this, and this is the Notre Dame speech. This is now 2009, not the 2006 speech. And within our vast democracy, it's always a move from democracy, within our vast democracy, we should be reminded, even as we cling to our faith, faith, to persuade through reason, through an appeal whenever we can to universal rather than parochial principles, mm -hmm. and most of all through the abiding example of good works and charity and kindness. And service. So that good works, charity and kindness is there, we cling to our faith, but then he inserts the proviso. Public reason. Yeah, well, and, and, and again, but what's key there is knowing what he's what what he understands that to be, okay. and he's drawing a from from a Rawlsian right. account. Right. This is what, what it's like, clearly Rawlsian. You you read that two thousand. Yeah, and actually, yeah, I talked absolutely. to Chuck and Eric about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, Chuck Matthews you get, you get Eric Robert, Robert George at, at um, Princeton. up at Princeton, and in, he engages Rawls and Habermas and others on this, and notes that that we that the idea of what public reason is is contested. It's a contested idea. Of course. And so this is drawn upon one that sets really that, that, that makes the religious stuff kind of always marginalized. It says it doesn't have sources that, 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 that can operate in public reason. Whereas Jews, for example, say, what about natural law and the Catholic Church? Well, sure, natural that, that, law. That's right. an account of public reason that, that would seek to add substance and content to these debates, that would yeah. seek to defend itself on, in rational terms. And yet, would be somewhat sectarian. It yeah. would, you know, uh, it, it, it wouldn't be thinned out in the same way. Close, that public... Closest Obama comes to that is the Golden Rule. Uh, but the Golden Rule is used, I rather deftly, to talk about, to talk about actually finding one's humanity. It's 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 a spiritual move. That the use of the Golden Rule isn't isn't, shall we say, a, a Kantian move or a public reason move. It's a kind of spiritual move. It, it it he used it to talk about finding one's humanity in the other. Yeah. You know, that's how he kind of does that. He does that actually very nicely, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, I don't mean that. I don't. No, I, fair I enough. Say, no, I, I, that I last comment was for you, was, as I said, was for you. Yeah, well, no, I thought, that's why I thought I had to comment on it. Yeah. Right? Well, I think it's important. Right. Right. I do too. So, anyway, it, when you look, you read uh, the quote that you have from Dr. Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. It can be public theology, but can might not it also just be, you know, discussion about moral value? Sure. This is where I thought King, whatever whatever public theology is, right? Whatever public theology is, King did something that is really good. <laughs> you know, you know, he brought together in this creative synthesis all these different traditions: African American religious experience, you know, popular psychology, culture, the American constitutional principles, all to try to kind of forge reflection. On, on justice. I mean, I mean, whatever whatever King's doing, be it public, I think it's really yeah, cool. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was just wondering, like, might not it, I mean, if the word public theology kind of causes people to go off in all different directions, right. you know, and, and of course, you know, we can all have our own interpretation of what morals mean, mm -hmm. but we all know, and you know, King always said, we live in a moral universe, and it, you know, and it bends towards justice. Bends towards justice, right? So, 
might that be a better way to kind of go about it? Because even in John Paul, which is John yeah. Paul, I mean, sure, we all want to be forgiven. We all want to be able to wipe the slate clean. These are like human things that we all want, right? irrespective of what kind of theology is wrapped mm -hmm. around. Okay, fair, fine, fair enough. Fair enough. I, I'm, I'm, I'm open to that reflection. Yeah, so I mean, that's a way to, you know, whoever this guy was. That, uh, that Femus. Yeah, no, yeah, it's just, it seems like all of a sudden people are upset about public theology. And uh, I know you made a comment. I'm, I'm wondering about this discourse on human reason, I'm not, or the public reason. I'm not sure what that means when you talked about this. I don't really know the, a lot what of, the issue is. A lot of contemporary theory about democracy and about about politics within democracies is concerned with the kind of discourse we have. I mean in the sense of when we sit what does it mean to sit down together and talk and argue and are there any kind of constraints upon that activity? Okay. So what can I appeal to? You know, can I, if I sit down, for example, we might agree that that that, that relatively um, uncontroversial sources of knowledge like a dictionary or an encyclopedia or a science textbook, we might say, look, we can all appeal to this, it's a common authority. But what about the Bible? Or what about um, individual subjective experience? You know, I say, well, but I feel really deeply about this. What are appropriate resources? So some things, I, if, it's, if it's a legitimate resource, then I, I'm bound, to, if I respect you, to respond to those claims. You've given me a, a, a claim about, let's say, greenhouse gases and global warming or about some other issue. I have to respond to that. If you give me a feeling, or if you give me a Bible verse, I can legitimately, at least for some thinkers, say, I don't, I can kind of just go, well, that's really nice. I, you know, it's, I, I appreciate, you know, that you have these thoughts, but it's, it's irrelevant. It's not appropriate. It's not part of public reason. Does that kind of make sense? Kind of yeah, common it, currency, right? But it, is it not because it, it's not based on fact? Well, it's because it, it's, it's not commonly accessible. It's not accessible okay. for all people. Yeah. Like, okay. The well, Bible, you have to believe that it actually is. Like, for example, you have to believe that Scripture is revelatory. It tells us about God's will for us. Okay. Well, you have to believe that. That's not a fact. It's a stuff yeah. Right. So okay. the people that don't believe that wouldn't accept that yeah. as a legitimate. And so there's been a lot of effort okay. to try to characterize what public reason then looks like, and it almost inevitably leads to the marginalization or exclusion of certain voices and perspectives that maybe in the past have been more easily accommodated. Again, religious perspectives or, okay. or phil certain philosophical perspectives even. Uh, and, and so what, what we're kind of commenting on here is that, that Rawls and, and then some of these thinkers have, have been the most systematic thinkers in the 20th century to try to, to, to lay out what public reason is. And so that we as citizens in a democracy can begin to understand what virtues and, and orientations are appropriate for us as citizens in public discourse. How should I speak to you in the public realm? When I go to justify a, a new public policy, let's say on abortion, or this is what this is what Obama was getting at. When I go to make a law about abortion, I don't cite scripture; I cite a publicly accessible reason for it. That's what that's my okay. duty as a citizen, in a sense. And if I do cite scripture, I'm breaking the rules. I'm acting inappropriately. Okay. Does that kind of make sense? I do. I guess. Yeah. So yeah. The, the, one of the interesting things about this is that, like, we're having this conversation now, and as Brett pointed out, none of us had a real problem with the idea that that someone like Obama could use religious or theological language, and neither did the people at Notre Dame, because we're, because we're kind of in a religiously homogenous setting, more or less, you know? And so we, got, we kind of get it. But um, what's interesting is, is it, I don't know if we've actually done this, but it, it, would, it seems like you need to acquire the habits of your mind so that, and, and perhaps of the heart, but certainly habits of the mind to know your audience enough to then speak to them in, in a way that's persuasive. Right? Well, if, like if, I'm, if I'm talking to people who share my religious presuppositions, I'm going to speak one way about a topic. Whereas if I'm speaking to a, an audience that doesn't share my religious suppositions, I might appeal to a more public well, reason. Well, that's a pragmatic issue. The Rawls and stuff is a principled issue. There are certain kinds of, I ought not to seek to persuade you based on certain kinds of, of, of language or concepts. That would be wrong for me to do so in a sense. What I might be able to. No, I guess what I was just saying is that, okay, Rawls's can be principled. That doesn't take my point away, which is that I can learn, uh, that I acquire certain habits of the mind because I'm in various subcultures. That's what I was trying to get at. Okay. Like, like, right, like, like I, you know, we're right. academics, I, 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 so we're talking a certain that. kind of language. If I had this same conversation with my wife, 
she'd look at me like I have five heads. And she's really bright, so I'd have to translate it into a different... You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. sure. No, That's all I was trying absolutely. to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, we can equip, we can our minds can acquire these skills to be able to do that, which right. is pretty cool. Yeah. Whereas when you're in a modulus sure, community, sure. you don't have. I was. That's all I was yeah, just yeah, observing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Let me yeah. just jump in just to say that I, we're a little bit past three, right. so I just oh, wanted to be able to have to go. People's time. Okay. No, no, no. I'm happy to continue the conversation if you want to, but. Can I get a little mini extra copies of this? Sure, I got lots of copies too. Yeah. Well, thank, thanks, this Bill. Is great. Thank yeah. you. That was awesome. All right, great. Thanks very much. All right. Thank you all.